are you there? I am. <laughs> okay. So, Bron, um, where are you physically located in the world right now? I'm in Gainesville, Florida. That's North Central Florida. Okay. So here we have Gainesville. And um, we were yeah. just chatting and you are saying it's about 100 meters above sea level, which is not a bad thing given what I hear about sea level rise and Florida. <laughs> If you're, if you have to be in Florida, it's uh, it's relatively high ground. Yeah. Okay. Heady uh, altitudinous. Pretty amazing stuff. Okay. I'm just going to fly to Brisbane where I am, just so everyone can see um, <clears throat> see where we are respectively communicating through this amazing technology platforms. And so that's where I am, round about here next to that uh, dark green blot, which is a um, well, Mount Kuta. Uh, where there are three TV stations located, which you can see right here, which mm -hmm. soon will be blockaded by an extinction rebellion type project. Um, anyway, more on that soon on a different project. Okay, great. Now, Bron, can you, um, for the audience, tell us um, who you are and what it is that you do, and particularly with reference to that book that I can see over your shoulder? <laughs> That's a big one. Well, um I'm a professor of religion, nature, and environmental ethics. So I consider myself an interdisciplinary environmental studies scholar. Um, I teach at the University of Florida, and I teach courses uh, in environmental ethics that look at human uh, relationships to uh, our natural surrounds and the ways that spiritualities, emotions, and religions uh, get entangled with the way people think of uh, themselves and their place in the biosphere and in the universe. Sometimes I just put it simply, I study the human animal, the human animal's relationship to uh, all the other organisms and uh, entities in the biosphere. Okay, and one of the, um, the terms that comes across, if one were to Google your name, is this concept of um, dark green religion. Can you share with us what that is? Sure. And given your fancy technology, I can probably pull up, uh, if I can figure this out, I can probably pull this uh, image up so you can follow along like the, yeah, that's the great. bouncing ball. Let's see if this works. Oh, wrong one. Uh, let's try that again. Can you see it now? Uh, I have got um, three more. You got dark green religion. Yep. Oops, that's. I wanted to go back. Well, I'm a little lost. Let's see if I can find this. I'm glad you can cut this part out. No, I'll keep it in. It's all good. <laughs> Nobody's in a rush here. <laughs> all right. So. Um, <clears throat> maybe maybe a little background on the book. Um, I've spent a lot of time really starting off uh, studying grassroots environmental movements around the world. Mm -hmm. And I began to notice certain patterns that were really quite common within what I call the global environmental milieu. Namely, the places where people who are uh, ardently concerned about our environmental predicaments um, get together uh, and... Uh, sometimes argue with one another, sometimes uh, join common cause against what they consider to be um, common adversaries in order to try to uh, move us in a more sustainable direction. What I began to notice is that within this milieu, although there are many, many points of view um, and sometimes significant internal con contention, because we have some people who are kind of grassroots activists, some quite radical and militant, all the way to people working uh, under the United Nations umbrella on uh, international laws and treaties, that you could begin to see some common patterns emerge in the ways in which people uh, think and feel about their obligations uh, to one another and to the biosphere that they are uh, a part of and help to constitute. Uh, so eventually, these patterns began to uh, occur in my mind as, as something that might have a great deal of cultural traction. Um, and that indeed I 
came to the view that these sorts of ideas and perceptions were spreading pretty rapidly around the world insofar as these things go and capturing a significant part of the kind of what we might call the worldviews of the, the human community. The items here, I, I, I list a number of them uh, here on the screen, which is kind of a summary of what I call dark green religion. Um, by dark green, just before we even look at these, I mean uh, to try to get at the idea of a kind of a deep and in, uh, a deep valuing of nature for its own sake. So kind of dark in the sense of what some people call deep ecology, that yeah. the entire natural world, uh, as it says here, has intrinsic value and deserves respect and even, and even reverence. Um, but the, the title also has a flip side, dark sometimes evoking a kind of sense of uh, danger. And for some, what I call dark green religion, uh, be seen as spiritually or politically or morally dangerous mm -hmm. and in some sense if we're going to talk about the religious dimensions of something um, and if you're a religion scholar like me you're quite aware that religion often has a shadow side uh, or even worse than the shadow side a kind of uh, overarchingly negative political social and ecological uh, impact so uh, just sort of acknowledging that ambiguity is what the term kind of gets at. But typically what we keep seeing people in all sorts of different places around the world articulating is, are these kinds of items? Not that everybody who resonates with this stuff would say it exactly the same way or respond with each of these ideas, but these are really quite common out there in the global environmental milieu. Mm -hmm. And I think that I would say that part of what you're doing is, a, is uh, coheres quite a bit with these sorts of things. Yeah, and, and in reading some of your work on dark green religion, you're saying that, that using this as a definition that, for example, Greenpeace would actually uh, fit within that definition of a religion in as much as it holds that nature is sacred and that people then go and perform actions that demonstrate that belief, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and, you know, people can have different things in their mind, but the, the notion of, of the sacred, and we can talk about that in a minute, um, there tends to be some similar things that people have in their mind when they think about something like this. But anyway, here are the basic ideas. Nature is sacred. Everything has intrinsic value. Oftentimes, um, people in this milieu have a Darwinian and an evolutionary understanding that all life has a common ancestor, and thus we're quite literally we are kin. We are biologically related with corresponding moral responsibilities, just as you uh, have special kinship obligations to your immediate family. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you, that you don't have kinship obligations to uh, uh, more distant relatives, whether, they, whether they're human or non-human. And I think that's part of what we're getting at here. And, and you're Certainly, saying, and, and, yeah, you're saying and, there, and this, and this, and this idea that you've identified and named dark green religion, you're saying you're seeing it spreading, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and um, <clears throat> as, as someone who's, who does interdisciplinary work, I'm kind of part ethicist, that's my Aboriginal training, uh, part of social scientist. And so I have spent a lot of time looking at social scientific uh, research, both what we call qualitative, uh, or ethnographic, where we, um, and that sort of study is basically long-term observation, uh, hanging out and interviewing people, and then quantitative research, or what people uh, might know better as survey research, um, questionnaires and so forth. And through qualitative and quantitative research, we increasingly can see that these sorts of ideas that are on the screen and on the next one have significant cultural traction. Mm -hmm. This also goes along with the rise of what social scientists are recognizing as the so-called nuns. These are people who are no longer tethered to the world's predominant and longstanding religions, but are seeking meaning, connection, uh, and uh, ethical benchmarks beyond them. And oftentimes the people that are doing that are finding meaning and connection in a kind of a reverence for life. 
uh, as we stay here, you know, feelings of belonging and connection to nature, uh, the ecological principle of interconnection, humility about the human place in the world. And uh, I think I can try to go to the next slide here too. Um, yeah, well, uh, this is the next slide that another shared dynamic here is a, to use a fancy uh, word, epistemological premises. And that's basically just how do we know what we know and how do we arrive at uh, a proper spiritual perception? Mm -hmm. And increasingly people uh, who have affinity with what I've, for lack of a better term, called dark green religion, emphasize direct visceral sensory experience in nature emphasize scientific understandings, which, as we mentioned before, kind of displaces human beings from the center of the universe and challenges the notion that the world was just made for us. And also there's a sense within these movements that the arts in all sorts of ways can awaken or evoke uh, what we might call uh, these dark green religious or spiritual perceptions. Mm. <clears throat> and can you, um, can you, um... Oh, do you want to speak to this next slide? Well, I could, this is, these, these are the, the last of the main points. And okay. yep. um, what we commonly find, I found this in, uh, you'll have to help me with the pronunciation with your initiative again. Perium. Perium. Yeah. Um, I saw in, in what you've written uh, an understanding of life after death, but yeah. it's not the one that's quite common in most of the world's religions, which has something to do with some kind of divine rescue from this world, but rather life after death is being reabsorbed into mm. uh, the environmental systems of the planet mm. and our bodies become uh, absorbed in other beings and we do exist in other forms in a very naturalistic way. Yeah. So that's yeah. quite common among these dark green uh, religionists, wow. if we can call them that. Yeah. And then of course, experiences of awe and wonder at uh, the beauties, the terrors uh, of the world and ultimately a, a deep love of and for nature are the, so those are the kind of 10 most common mm. uh, themes that I find among people all over the world. And uh, from what I've seen in your, in your writings, uh, there's a lot of affinity with what you've written and this kind of dark green yeah. spirituality. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, <clears throat> can we come off the share screen? Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> So let me, let me, let me explain, um, we'll just refer to Perium. Let me explain what that project's about. And um, because I'd like to try and, um, I'm hoping this, this interview I'm hoping will inform the work that I've done on Perium to take it to another level. So let me just share sure. it very quickly. Uh, the story that I mentioned to you a few months ago is that um, uh, 2016 or 2015, the Pope put out his encyclical and I thought the Catholics were gonna save the planet. And then I realized that they won't. And I realized that mainstream religion probably wasn't a proper uh, vector, if you like, for um, really getting the job done of, you know, of, of encouraging people to take the appropriate actions to prevent climate change and species extinction, which by my reading as an environmental scientist um, says that we've effectively started a rerun of the Permian extinction. And if we don't handle the climate thing right, we're going to shift the planet into the hothouse, which is going to basically kill off most of life on the planet more so even than the Permian extinction because of three factors. Firstly, is it's happening a hundred times faster. Um, and secondly, because we've got, um, we've got things now that we didn't have back then, such as plastics in the ocean. I saw a photograph of a celiocanth, which is an ancient fish, I think about 400 million year old fish that survived the great dying 253 million years ago. Um, and this one was dead with a plastic bag in its stomach. <laughs> So we're going to do a rerun of the Permian extinction a hundred times faster with plastics in the ocean and with the nuclear fallout that comes from when all the power stations melt down. So, so what we've actually created, what the humans have created, and this is really since the industrial revolution times, um, is that we've created a Holocaust of life on earth. Um, uh, that we're, we, you know, the report came out a week ago, the UN biodiversity report saying that we've killed off 74% of wildlife, that most of, you know, there's a million species that are imminently going to go extinct. You know, part of this problem, um, Bron, is um, that we don't have language to describe what that is. That, like, so the, I'm struggling to create words. I'm, I'm always finding that there are, is a new opportunity for new words. 
And so one of the words that I'm looking for or phrases is, or is how do you describe um, what we have done ethically? So I had, I had um, <clears throat> Paul Elric on this channel a, a week ago, and he said that um, modern ethics is a footnote to Plato, which is basically to say it hasn't really moved much in the last 3,000 years. But so how do we approach the ethics of having actually nearly set a pathway to extinguish most of life on Earth? And, that's, and, that, ties into, and it's, that ties into this idea of the sacred that you've referred to in the dark room religions. So can you talk about sacred and can you talk about how, where sacred exists in a modern consumerist capitalist based culture? Because I don't think anything is sacred in this culture, particularly nothing related to the environment. So let me, let me start with Paul Ehrlich since you raised uh, his name. Um, a few decades ago in one of his early books, he said, if we're going to change the way we think and our ethics, we're going to need it. And, and he called it a, a new quasi religion that would involve a reverence for the earth. And it's interesting, many environmental scientists and environmental historians and other scholars have had that kind of intuition that the world's predominant religions, most of which emerged during the so called axial age from two to 4,000 years ago, they may have represented a certain kind of advance for cultures at that time, but they certainly didn't understand a great deal that we understand today. So I sometimes uh, start talks by asking people, if you were around when the great sages uh, in the axial age were teaching, if you had listened to Jesus or if you had listened to Gautama the Buddha, would you have predicted at that time that two millennia later or more, uh, there would be seven billion people on the planet and a very large proportion of those would be devotees of that individual? You probably wouldn't, mm. but it didn't take that long for those teachings to catch fire and to spread widely. Uh, now, when I think about dark green spirituality or the kind of religion that you're talking about which i think has a lot of affinity one with another uh, in fact at one point in my book i say if i'm not crazy then people reading this book are going to think of all they're all going to have their own examples of this that i don't know anything about yeah. so when i do the second edition there's a good chance i'm going to be talking about you it's just you know here's a, here's another example emerging mm -hmm. organically from oz mm -hmm. uh <laughs> but the uh the idea that about 160 years ago, Darwin articulated his theory, and he ended that he ended this uh, he ended this with this wonderful paragraph that's really quite well known, where he tells people there's a there's a grandeur to this view of life of how all this beauty and all this diversity came to be. And with a conservative Christian wife who was worried about the state of his soul, he, he not only held off on uh, writing up his findings, but he was very sympathetic to those who would find it uh, unsettling, to say the least, to have a, a completely different account of how uh, life emerged and how it reached this kind of complexity. Mm. So when I think about these newer forms of nature-based, scientifically literate nature spiritualities. And I think these have only been uh, gathering, these have only been emerging and gathering strength really since the Darwinian revolution. Mm. Now there were antecedents to them to be sure mm. um, that had their own revolutionary impacts, the Copernican revolution, you know, and, and we could talk about a lot of those. And certainly Darwin stood on the shoulders of many people. But it really was, in my judgment, and in the judgment of many others, a kind of decisive moment in unsettling worldviews. So when you are at loose ends, what do you do? Well, a lot of people have decided that what they're going to do is take their senses, what they can know through their ordinary senses as we amplify them with our clever gadgets in various ways, and build a worldview and an understanding of who we are and our place in the biosphere and our place in the universe in that way. And that's, that's been going on uh, 
and deepening our understanding uh, for only a few generations. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the, the, the survey research, um, to the extent that we have it, we, we have a lot more work to do, but we see these kinds of worldviews indeed gaining cultural traction and spreading around the world. And people like you thinking, well, what do we call it? People like me as a scholar, analytically, what do we call it? Uh, and I just came up with, in some ways like you, with a trope for some of this, uh, just to get people thinking, uh, not because I'm trying to make a new re dark green religion, I'm, I'm not, but I think it has uh, explanatory power to look at uh, the kinds of common patterns that are emerging wherever people are reasonably well uh, educated scientifically. So to my mind, there's, uh, there's something really salutary in this because uh, we're, we don't have to rely on the mystical insight of some seer or sage from uh, millennia ago, mm -hmm. but we can collaboratively work out our understanding of what the world is like and our place in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good point, actually, about, <clears throat> about not, not needing to rely on, on the so-called seer i mean who knows whether the seer was actually seeing anything or whether he's just making it up and getting away with it right yeah um and so what i've tried to do i'm um, if if it's okay i'm going to share the screen now and go to, and go to the perian perian website um and i'll just walk through a few things but um about that about the idea of that sage you know i think that our culture doesn't actually know who the sages are and so for me you know you're you're a sage for me um Paul Ulrich is a sage for me. Will Stefan is a sage for me, you know, but when you go and talk to most people, I'm, I'm doing some Uber driving at the moment. So I'm getting a whole bunch of normal people. <laughs> That's a good thing to do always. It's, it's a really good, it's a real good grounding for me. Cause I normally sure you're think, hanging out with regular folks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause normally I'm hanging out with like environmentalists and intellectuals and, you know, and so it's really difficult to understand how we see the world. And wondering why it's all going crazy outside it's because there's all these normal people out there and so and also having the normal people around is sort of helping me to learn how to actually talk to them about these important things and so one thing i know about normal people is that they don't really know they don't know who sages are right they think that sages are sports sports stars or reality tv show people you know thousands and thousands of people will turn up Fifty-six thousand people turned up in townsville for example to see elton john and I, was, I got invited, not to the Elton John show, but to, this, to, to the stadium. They filled the stadium. And I got invited to the stadium for, to a football match. I don't watch football matches. But anyway, and I asked, I asked this socialite uh, who knew Townsville really well, the town. I said, who, who, who's an environmentalist that we could bring into this auditorium that we could fill it to the brim like they did with Elton John? She said, I don't think any could do that in this town. So you've got an entire city which will turn up to watch a football game, but they won't. <laughs> up to watch a right. leading environmentalist say guys the planet's about to end and so there's this that that is that is something deeply that is some that is a, a way of understanding the sustainability crisis which goes well beyond the economics and the technology and the politics there's something wrong in the way that humans are relating to the planet and what i'm trying to do with perium is i'm trying to i'm trying to fix that i guess really i'm just trying to create um you know and and the reason why it's 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 framed around the religion if you know we had a census in australia a year or so ago in which 65 percent of the public ascribed to a religion so you know religion is not a dirty word it is amongst a bunch of intellectual atheists maybe but amongst most people it's kind of just a part of daily life so what i've been trying to do is i've been trying to take all of the best of sustainability thinking and contemporary climate science and make it available through that structure called called religion um, now, I'm not sure what it's good for, really. I mean, I can say why I did it, but where, what, what needs to happen to take this idea so that it spreads and becomes um, better? What I'd like to, if I can do, if I can just show you a couple of points on this web page. Um, uh -huh. uh, so I this, little, this little intro, it refers to Religion Earth. So this project has actually gone through about four or five different names, um, uh, and, and it might even be renamed again because it uh, depends on whether it's actually a good name in order for it to spread. I, a friend of mine the other day was bagging me, telling me that it was too confusing. But anyway, um, but in here, so my, 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 my rationale is that 
the Australian Taxation Office is the arbiter of what a religion is in Australia. If you wanted to have a registered religion that was structured like a normal one, you'd need to get the Australian Taxation Office to sign off on it. And their definition of a religion is a belief in a supernatural entity, being or thing, and the canons of conduct that give effect to that belief. And so what I've done is I've sort of defined a supernatural um, and that supernatural I've, in, I've named Imperium Vitae Planeta. Now I can understand my, why my friend would tell me off for using such a complicated name, but there's, a, there's an underlying intellectual rationalization for this, um, which is simply that the, the, the supernatural, initially when I started framing this, um, I was thinking that the supernatural was Gaia, but Gaia is a scientific theory. Um, which so it doesn't really pass the supernatural test. Um, and so what I thought, well, if Gaia theory says that all the living things on the planet have behave in the manner of a single living organism, we could actually step into the supernatural world, the beyond science world, the world of belief, by saying, well, let's, let's believe that all the living things on the planet are a single living organism. And I, I share that idea around to a lot of people. And a lot of people, in, in, in fact, even... The other day, I was with a, a Pentecostalist Christian, and I shared that idea, and she said, I agree with that. So, so you would agree that you are a, a cell in a body? She said, yes, even as a, even as a you know, the closest thing to the Taliban in the, in the Christian religion. So it's actually an idea that actually has a lot of ground. Um, so that then becomes the, the supernatural, the idea that all the living things on the planet, including us, part are cells in the body of a single living organism. Well, if that's the case, then what is its taxonomic classification? It needs a binomial. So that's what I went through. Is I went through a, um, a thought process. Let me just um, bring this up uh, right there. Uh, I'll show you the, 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 I wrote down the thought process in an article. Um, So if you were to go to this article here, <clears throat> The Empire of Life Needs a Proper Name, which was published in an Australian uh, online journal. <clears throat> so this basically outlines the argument of how I came to the name um, Imperium Vitae Planeta. Um, so, and, from, and so basically, the, you know, Imperium then is this super organism of which we are all a part. Now, when, when you see yourself as living as a part of a super organism, um, as opposed to being an individual amongst some other individuals, it sort of changes your referential frame when it comes to things like pollution. Because what you're realizing is that you're polluting your own body. When you drive your car and put CO2 gas into the atmosphere, you're actually harming your own self, as opposed to harming you know, everybody else, but not me because I've driven away from that pollution. So that's basically the heart of it. Now, the, the religion also, according to the Australian Taxation Office, needs um, practices that give effect to the belief. So I'm thinking, well, what, what would people do if they actually believed that they were cells in the, in the body of a superorganism? So what I've done is I've, I've been working through this over the years, it's been going about two and a half years, and these are the practices that I've outlined. So at all times, live with earthity. So earthity has basically been a good neighbor and a good environmentalist. There's nothing strange about that. You know, if you riding, having bikes, you know, and all that normal stuff. That's what you would do if you actually thought you were part of the, the, the super organism. On a daily basis, give thanks. And so we've got this funny thing called thanks plankton. You know, thanks plankton for producing 40% of the oxygen. You know, you know, salute a tree. Uh, this is quirky and funny, but it's supposed to be sort of inciting people to, you know, keep it at the front of the mind. Shake with the shrubbery. Um, Weekly basis has, you know, focus on your peri-emission. So this idea that a cell has got, all cells in the human body have got common, <clears throat> common traits, right? They all exchange gases. They all, you know, do different things. But cells have also got specialization. Some of them produce hair. Some of them produce fluid. Some of them produce proteins. So each individual should have a, a mission for peri-emission, uh, for imperium. So my mission is to make these videos and share them with people, write books, you know, invent dark green religions. <laughs> you're, you've got your peri mission that you're living. Um, on a monthly basis, celebrate the moon, either the full moon rise or the new moon rise. And the reason for that is um, because us Western people have completely lost track of natural cycles. I was actually, I mentioned that at a full moon party the other day and I was scolded by a woman 
who, who says <laughs> women haven't lost track of natural cycles. They've got their own monthly cycle as well, of course. But for us men in particular, anyway, uh, the moon, if you watch the moon rise, the, the human brain shifts it around and it, the moon looks much larger than it actually is. And so as this sort of, it's a very distinctive thing seeing a full moon rise. And of course, there's around 12 of them every year. Um, on an annual basis, um, celebrate a new year that actually speaks to the, to the living organism, to somehow that speaks to, because the way I understand it, new year on the 1st of January, the Western New Year, is actually a celebration of the circumcision of Christ. And when I actually learned that, I just decided I didn't want to celebrate the new year anymore on the 1st of January. It just wasn't appropriate. It's an auspicious thing. The day that you arbitrarily decide is the beginning and the end of the circle. And of course, different new years are different dates around. So my new year, or at least the new year for Perium Foundation chapter, and my invitation is that other people can create Perium chapters and define their own new year. So the idea as well of Perium is rather than being this monolithic religion, um, because, you know, so, so, so the Catholic Church is kind of a bit like McDonald's. It's the same everywhere. It's got the distinguished, distinctive architecture. It's got the distinctive menu. And of course, that, you know, it's different from McDonald's because their menu was written 2000 years ago and it doesn't change. So, so how, do you, how would you break that matrix? And if this is an earth-based religion, how would you make a religion that sort of conforms to the way that ecosystems operate. So the idea is that there's got a very flat structure. There's, there's basically a foundation chapter where the ideas are formed and then put out through the Bible, which is effectively the website. Um, and then all of the other chapters, there's anybody who puts their hands up to run the chapter. There's a, a simple ordination process where basically it's an environmental science quiz that tests that you understand principles of sustainability. And then you get to choose your new year as long as that new year speaks to Imperium, you can't say, okay, my new year is the 27th of May. Why? Because that's my mum's birthday. That's not really what we're trying to do here. Or, or oh, that's the day that you know, Harley Davidson was born. That's not what this is about. But if you said that your new year is um, uh, um, uh, uh, James Lovelock's birthday, well, that would make sense because it's speaking to what you're trying to do. So my new year is the, or this foundation chapter is, uh, coincident with the detonation of the Trinity bomb test because it's a sort of an arbitrary, not arbitrary, but it's a sort of a marker date for the beginning of the Anthropocene epoch. So what we do on that day is we have a, a, a party at night with a big bonfire and we set off like a nuke, we set off a little bomb thing uh, at 9.29 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time to signify or to commemorate the beginning of the modern era, for better or for worse. <clears throat> and then on a decadal basis, the recommendation is to go and visit a place where you can see the sky, absent artificial night sky uh, brightness. Um, and also on a decadal basis, go and visit a volcano. And the logic there um, is that you can see what lies above and below Imperium Vitae Planeta. Because what lies above Imperium Vitae Planeta is the vast coldness of space. And what lies below it is the bubbling, boiling, molten rock and iron of the earth's core and that sort of helps to frame how delicate it is uh, this thing that we um, live upon and then on a lifetime uh, basis once a lifetime like a journey to mecca go and visit and go and visit the uh, uffington white horse and there's lots of reasons why that makes an excellent sacred site not the least of which is the fact that it has been nurtured by humans for nearly three thousand years it was built without using fossil fuels it is made of chalk, which is the shells of phytoplankton. And so it is an animal made of plants. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm going to come off the share and, uh, and I'd like your, your thoughts on what I've just um, outlined there. Well, uh, this is fabulous uh, for me to listen to this. Um, there are so many ways I could riff on uh, that very interesting overview. Thank you for that. I think the first thing I would say is uh, it's interesting that you decided to start ruminating on this with the Australian, was it the tax authority? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And, uh, the definition of religion that is instanced in law in America is not dissimilar. Right. And the template for that 
definition really is a, a religious studies scholars today would say it's a, it's a kind of a, a biased Western template when right. it insists on this kind of supernatural, when the essence of religion is something supernatural, that's very much a kind of a Western assumption. Okay. Whereas there's, you know, for example, there are forms of Buddhism that are very, that have lots of supernaturalistic stuff in it, but there's also uh, what, we, what some would say are the, the forms closest to the Buddha's teaching himself that are not supernaturalistic at all. Um, so then is Buddhism in those forms a religion or is it not? Well, most people would say it is. Some people would say it's a philosophy. Hmm. But right off the bat, we're getting into this, this idea that there's a, a blurry line between where what one person thinks is religious and another isn't. Hmm. Now, these are differences that matter in a society in part because many societies give special privileges to religions. And why do they do that? Well, because they're born from those religions or they otherwise think that religions are a good thing for people. So we should, we should privilege them just like we would privilege a psychiatrist by saying that you don't have to testify against your clients. You know, there's good yeah. things about yeah. Yeah. that thing. So um, when I think about uh, what you're doing, uh, I think what you're doing is very similar to what a lot of people are doing organically around the world. Um, but you're doing it in an unusually creative way with regard to thinking about terminology and thinking about things that are common in religion, like ritual, mm -hmm. like pilgrimage, mm -hmm. um, and uh, how you integrate the scientific understandings into those things. So when I think about religion, as most religion scholars do, we think about things like uh, certainly beliefs and practices, uh, but also... Uh, practices that have to do with ethics, practices that have to do with orient, uh, helping to align yourself with the sacred, however that's, you know, yeah. per se. Yeah. So there's kind of mundane ethics and there's sacred ethics. And yeah. I, see that, uh, I see that in what you're doing. The terminology is interesting because as you know from reading the Dark Green Religion book, I, I uh, talk about um, what some, well, I talk about what, Dan Duty and I have called uh, the political theorist guy in earth religion. And then he won up to me with an even more clever uh, neologism. He called it terrapolitan earth religion or terrapolitan earth civilization. I like that. Terrapolitan. Terrapolitan, yes. And his basic idea with that is that such religion reorients us from uh, a, a sense of loyalty just to our own ethnicity or our own nation state, but to the earth itself. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that's very much what, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I put something up there. I wanted to find something else. Yep. Maybe I didn't find it. Oops. Let me try again. Oh, that's what I wanted. Oh, yep. Um, yep. So I guess in, in terms of what, and I would be happy to testify for you in court. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need the supernatural term because right. um, for many uh, many definitions of religions, very reputable ones from religion scholars, and, 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 uh, and certainly the way I look at it, is that you don't have to have something that's outside of nature or something that is super nature to have uh, religion. Right, uh, right. And that's why when I talk about Gaian spirituality, uh, as I did in this chart in my book, I said for some people, it does have a kind of supernaturalistic dimension to it. Um, and there's, there's, this could be pantheistic, right? Where, the, where Gaia is conceived of in, as, as a divinity in some way, or the universe as a whole mm. is conceived of as divine. But there's also those folks, and I think this is James Lovelock, uh, who are entirely naturalistic or scientific in their worldview, but look at the, the complex interconnections in the biosphere and think, hey, given, the, the long, given the early roots of the notion of Gaia as a kind of um, mother earth divinity, mm -hmm. why don't we take that from um, the Western tradition and uh, consecrate it with science mm -hmm. to reinforce our sense of the interconnectedness and mutual dependence of all life. And even if we do that in a way that is completely 
secular or naturalistic, that doesn't mean we can't bring rhetorics of the sacred into it. Uh, and indeed, I think it's, uh, we use terms like sacred to really demarcate what we think is most important, what we care about the most. So it's not surprising to me that you have uh, avowed atheists to have a kind of a Gaian understanding uh, and a Gaian ethics who nonetheless find themselves relying on uh, religion tinged terms like the, the earth as sacred mm. or a place that's been destroyed by logging or mining and they call that a desecration even though they have absolutely mm. nothing supernaturalistic in the way they understand the world. Yeah. So yeah. I think we're getting part of what we're seeing and I think your group and your, your initiative is a part of this. We're seeing uh, significant trends toward naturalistic forms of nature spirituality um, that that meet most of the criteria, at least for not all, but many definitions of religion that scholars hold anyway. Yeah, okay, that's um, that's really interesting. And it actually has triggered uh, just thinking through a few conversations I've had with some legal people about, um, about actually incorporating Perium and, and actually creating it as a, a registered religion, which um, there's there's reasons to do that and there's reasons not to do that. Um, if I were to go down that path, right. I'd need to get uh, an incorporated structure. I'd need to have a minimum of three directors and you apply as a registered charity and then you apply for the religious status. Here's, here's some interesting things and I think I've had some insights into this. So um, hypothetically, so in Australia, we've got this thing called DGR, which is deductible gift recipient status. And it basically says if you give a gift to a charity, a monetary gift to a charity with DGR, then you can claim that money as a tax deduction. Okay. Now, if you don't have DGR, so we had, I've got a nonprofit that I set up um, a few years ago and we had a guy, a wealthy guy gave us 10, he said, do you have DGR? He said, before, he, before anything else, that's the first question. We said, no. He said, okay, I'm going to give you $10,000. He says for your charity, which is called the long future foundation. He said, if you had DGR, I would give you $20,000, <laughs> right? Okay, so, so having DGR is a very important thing for any organization, whether it's a religion or not, you still need to have money coming right. to buy things, right? So, um, so here, here's how it works in Australia. If your charity is a, a, recognized as a religion, you get automatically, you get DGR, it's just a blanket, okay? However, if your charity is an environmental charity like the Long Future Foundation, <clears throat> um, you have to apply for DGR and then it's at the minister's discretion whether you get it or not. So let me explain the perversity of that. If you had a registered charity that was seeking to plant forests, okay, it is at the minister's discretion whether you get the tax benefit, okay, which effectively doubles your income from any donor. Whereas if you put forward a Pentecostal church or even if ISIS set up operations in Australia, they would automatically get de deductible gift recipient status because the religion is regarded as this thing which has got so much benefit to society, it does not need right. to go through a hurdle. Now, here's the other, the other thing, and this is what I tweaked from what you were saying. And because I thought about Buddhism as well, because Buddhism doesn't have that supernatural aspect. Um, so. So what I heard from the lawyers that I talked to was if I wanted to open a Pentecostal church and I had in my, um, in the, um, in the objects, basically, you know, what the mission statement is, you know, that we're going to worship Jesus and all the rest of it, that would go through with no problem at all. In fact, these things are popping up like mushrooms after the rain in Australia, these Pentecostal churches. But if I went to them um, with what I'm proposing, he says, you're probably not going to get them to actually accept it as a religion. Even though, and that's why I put so much effort into really thinking through the supernatural. So it trying was, to meet their definition. Yeah. It, need, it just needed to meet their definition. And that was the hurdle. And then the, the actual practices, the canons of conduct. I mean, even the, even the word canons of conduct, it lends itself to being this, you know, basically what they're saying, the taxation office is saying, if you're a Christian religion, or maybe one of those other mainstream ones, which is monotheistic, supernatural, then you're in. But if you're anything that's a little bit sort of, I don't know, on the nose, the minister doesn't like, sorry, you're not going to get your religious status and therefore you're not going to get your automatic um, deductibility and all of the other benefits that flow. 
So it's like a stack, stack, a deck stacked against nature. Yeah. Well, quite right. Um, I have a, a very good friend, former graduate student of mine, who's now a PhD in sociology, and he once was with the Sierra Club right. uh, as the vice president. His name is uh, Bernie Zalea, and he was, he's an attorney also, and he was doing uh, legal work for a firm in Idaho, and he was told that he couldn't continue his Sierra Club activism because some of their clients would object. And he said, well, my Sierra Club activism is uh, a, a deep part of my religious sensibility. He, he happens to call himself a, a, a Christian pantheist. Right. And it is a religious duty of my religion to try to defend the earth. Yeah. Well, they fired him and he, fire, he filed a lawsuit uh, based on uh, uh, religious protection grounds. Right. Yeah. And ultimately, uh, this suit was settled out of court so we didn't get case law but it's very uh, there's a lot of good reason to be testing some of these uh in my judgment antiquated cases by in some sense not trying to conform too much to these antiquated and regressive definitions of religion that that do exactly what you're saying which is to preclude those who are developing uh spiritualities of belonging and connection to nature Hmm. Um, and you know, all these religions, they didn't, they all emerged sometime. Yeah, and there's also this bias that, that if something is old religion, then it's real religion. And if something's new religion, then it's not real religion. Well, that's to a religion scholar. That's, uh, well, this is a polite company. You, you, you know, I'd use a word like BS or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. They all started somewhere. I mean, somebody had to... They all started somewhere. And the truth is that most of them die out because they're not ecologically and socially adaptive. The mm -hmm. ones that have still been more socially and ecologically adaptive than, uh, than the opposite of that are still with us. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth asking in a thousand years or two thousand years, what are, the, what are the understandings that humans are going to have that are going to help them to uh, adapt uh, in synergistic and sustainable ways uh, on planet Earth. And my hunch is that most of the longstanding predominant religion, unless they transmogrify themselves much more deeply and rapidly than they have proven adept to do so far, mm. that they'll simply fade away. Not entirely, mm. but what's going to, what, so part of what I like to ask is, what are going to be the prevailing worldviews and religious and spiritual understandings in 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, 3,000 years, 5,000 years, mm. uh, a million years from now? Mm. And I don't think it's going to have a lot to do with the axial age religions. Mm. Why? Because we're sensory creatures and we learn over time, even if we're slow learners. Mm. So the kinds of stuff that you're brainstorming, to me, seems to be uh, to have a much greater chance of having some staying power, um, just as many of the other forms that are emerging today, uh, people pilgrimage to sacred places all over, cathedral forests in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, shoot, in, in Australia, as you well know, uh, some of the earliest uh, forest defense campaigns were occurring at uh, Terrania Creek and, uh, uh, in the, at the Franklin River against the dam, where you could, uh, and I certainly would, argue that people had a deep sense of reverence and uh, a sense of the sacred in those forests that were going to be uh, bulldozed or, or drowned. Mm. And their protests there were a form of ritual reverence for what they considered to be sacred. Mm. Mm. That kind of practice is deeply spiritual or religious, if you want to use that terminology. And I'm not hung up on that terminology. We don't need to use it. Mm. But I think it, I think it has some explanatory power. And also, given the hegemony of the predominant religions, which have not been very interested, and we can talk about why, but for deep, long-standing cultural reasons, that, in a nutshell, that have to do with more with. Uh, helping people to cope with their, their everyday lives, their existential qualms, and promise them a, a, 
a long-term future, a rescue from the biosphere, that's very different than what we're finding among people who have a very naturalistic understanding and are building a worldview, are building ethical mores, spiritual principles, practices. Mm. Uh, and depending on what bioregion there is, they're in, people are doing this in all sorts of ways. Mm. Certainly solstice celebrations, mm. uh, and you don't have to be a pagan uh, yeah. these days yeah. to be practicing solstice celebrations or having watershed festivals to celebrate the return of the salmon, right? Yeah. And yeah. all the community comes together. This stuff's yeah. going on all over the world right now. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. And, it, and, it then, and it then it comes back to one of my core questions that I wanted to pose to you, which is, um, what, what is the benefit? So if this stuff is already going on all over the place, then what is, is there a benefit in having something that is structured the way that I've structured um, Perium? Because it is, it's very thought through, it's very intellectual, it's very structured. Um, is, is, there, is, there, is there a benefit in having that? Or is it just a structured version of something that everyone's doing already? Or lots of people are doing already. You know, it comes well, back to the question: What what is perium good for? Yeah. Well, one thing that w when we think, I got interested in religion and social change a long time ago. I was looking at the peace movement, the anti nuclear movement, uh, struggles for justice in Latin America, and although religion is usually conservative, it kind of it's usually dominated and entangled with the the ruling elites. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Yeah. And sometimes there are breakthroughs. Yeah. And so when, when we think about social change, some scholars think about what we might call this, this whole school of resource mobilization. What do you need? What sorts of resources are necessary for a, a social movement to gain tra cultural traction? Yeah. Well, in the civil rights movement, people were poor, but they were underemployed. So they had time. Right. So they were materially poor, but they were time rich yeah so yeah. grassroots organizing phone trees you know and they used the churches that were all the black churches largely uh and the liberal white churches that were already set up with back not fax machines many of you know mm. mimeograph machines and mm. telephones right mm. so they used the resources that were available environmental groups are often funded by relatively affluent people mm -hmm. who are time starved but materially rich yeah so they donate to groups where they can get a tax deduction and they support them, but they don't have as much time to contribute. So they professionalize it, right? Yeah. They hire professionals to lobby and advance their causes, to organize the protests and so forth. So it really depends on, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to contribute to organizing for good, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a group like this in Australia uh, that could develop networks around the world on the one hand you can connect with other people that are doing similar things there can be networks of networks and this is going on mm -hmm. there's i was talking this last summer with a, a fella in north america who's forming a, a, a church of deep ecology mm -hmm. there was another effort to do this uh, a few decades ago that petered out um this one might not uh and uh so there's also the fact that many in Aboriginal and indigenous cultures around the world are uh, increasingly expressing that they have uh, a deep sense of reverence for uh, the lands that they have long inhabited and the way in which they view the sacredness of places and animals and so forth has often been viewed as primitive and not really religious. Mm -hmm. Well, so there's battles to be fought to recognize that those sensibilities are indeed religious and they should get respect. But it's not just native folks who feel that way yeah. because yeah. we're all human beings. We have this, we share a common ancestor. We have the same cognitive and emotional repertoire. So it's completely unsurprising that many people with uh, uh, different color skin and different histories in their own ways, come to similar emotional and uh, uh, spiritual connections to uh, non-human organisms and environmental systems as a whole. Mm -hmm. So there's a real convergence going on here. And I sometimes say there's a tremendous race on planet Earth right now between people who, are, who, have, a, who have developed in various ways a deep sense of reverence for the Earth and uh, its environmental systems and 
don't want to see uh, anthropogenic climate change or species extinction. And one way to advance that is to articulate and advance uh, very specific religious claims in some ways as a counterweight to fundamentalist religious claims that are really about trying to deny that we are all one species, yeah. that we are yeah. biologically related to every other species, that we have ethical obligations to every form of life. Mm. So to me, it's a, uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not a conventionally religious person in any, in any sense of the word, but religion sometimes has great power. And I don't think that people who have these sorts of uh, feelings and spirituality should right. cede the religious landscape just to those who want divine rescue from this world. Okay, I think you've actually just answered my question. It's, it's, um, there is the power in the, in the, in the, 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 so the power is that when you have the logo that is repeated, the power is in the repetition, the power is in the structure because the structure is, looks stronger than non-structure. The fact that all of the communication comes out on the same letterhead. I did a, I've just completed a, nearly completed a master of business. And one of the um, classes was um, a, it's corporate communications, basically marketing corporate communications. And what was stated was the very first thing that organizations do when they start going down the pathway is that they standardize all of their branding. Okay. So when, when Shell decided to get serious about being Shell, it made sure that all the Shell letterhead had the same logo. The logo type was, the logo was defined, the, the font type was defined, the colors were defined. Um, and so what that does is it creates the sense of strength, strength through the discipline of the structure. And I think that's, I think that's where the power of Perium comes in because in a way, all I'm really doing is channeling what people are already doing in a way. I'm just sort of trying to define it a little bit better. Um, I did, there's one other thing as well. Um, are you are you be familiar with uh, an, an author called Scott Atran, Atram or Atran? Atran, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I came across his work a little while ago. Um, <laughs> it's funny. So there was a, um, uh, on the Gold Coast of Queensland, there's a place called Black Swan Lake, which is a borrow pit, which is basically a big hole in the ground that they, they, the property developers dug in order to get the ground to lay, to raise the ground up so that they could put houses on this canal estate. And so they created an artificial lake, which after 30 years had become a very popular place for people to go and to spend time in nature because it reverted back to nature. It had extremely biodiverse. There's lots of birds in there. There's fish in there. It's like a really, it's like a, you know, that's what nature does if you just stop mucking around with it, right? You dig a hole in the ground, leave it for 30 years, you're gonna come back to a biodiverse piece of you know habitat well the local um turf club so horse racing club it was on their land and they decided because they were growing um that they needed to have an overflow car park they needed another car park for those days when it got really really busy so they basically sent the bulldozers in to fill in the lake irrespective mm. of the fact that it was a biodiverse habitat so a local protest group called save black swan lake popped up and um, I, I knew of them through their Facebook posting. And basically, they, they didn't do what was required to stop the Turf Club and the, and the Gold Coast City Council from filling in the lake, right? There was nobody laying under the bulldozers. There was nobody super gluing their nuts to the blades. There was none of that passion that you, 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 you mm -hmm. see sometimes in those protests. Yeah. Right. Now, at the same time, on the other side of the world, five guys jumped out of a car, taxi cabs, with machine guns and suicide belts and zapped 50 people because a French newspaper, a political magazine had put a picture of Muhammad on the cover. And so I'm thinking, how is it that we've got these people over here prepared to murder and die themselves, in, okay, to, to protect the name of their, of their God? Whereas the local environmentalists over here can't even be fucking bothered to lie under a bulldozer to stop the biodiverse habitat, which is connected to the very structure that keeps them alive as a living organism on the planet. And so I was trying to, that, that occurred to me. And so Scott Atram helps to explain that. So he goes to the front lines of the wars where the Kurds are fighting the ISIS and he interviews them. He takes a questionnaire to the front 
fine. There's mortars coming down and machine gun bullets and, and car bombs going off. And he says, okay, uh, question, what's your name? <laughs> anyway, but what he found was that the Kurds, who they couldn't interview the ISIS because he would have been executed instantly. But he interviewed the Kurds and he says, why, why is it that you left your friends and your family and you came to this terrible place to risk so much? And they express this thing called Kadaiti. Kadaiti is a reverence for the Kurdish language and the Kurdish right to live in those regions. And so for them, Kadaiti is this spiritual, is the sacredness. And, and so they are fighting to protect this sacred value. And what I've realized from that is that you get more bang for your buck from a human being when you mm -hmm. appeal to the spirituality than you do to the rationality. Because if you listen to the Black Swan Lake people talking, they didn't talk about a spiritual connection to the wildlife. They talked about the rationale of biodiversity conservation. And so that's something else that I think I'm trying to bring up through um, Perium is to, is to create a structured way that people who don't presently have that reverence for nature to create the pathway in, in for them. So it's written down clearly and it's easy to understand. Uh, another expression that I've created is um, ecophony. And, I, and, and a lot of people who I talk about ecophony, they automatically re resonate with it. So ecophony is an ecological epiphany. And so I had my first ecological epiphany or ecophony in, in my 20s when I was working in the oil industry. I was working in oil exploration on ships and we were traveling around the planet making a complete mess of the place. But we're off the coast of Taiwan and I was watching plastic, this is 30 years ago, watching plastic bags flooding past the ship and even though we we're 10 miles off the coast and it was at that time and over those over those two years in that industry they just had these successive ways of understanding and that's what and that's how you know I, did, I wasn't brought up as an environmentalist I wasn't brought up as a religious household it was sort of atheistic nobody really talked about it um, but but I discovered um, my reverence for nature through that sequence of ecophonies and pretty much everyone I know who's an environmentalist can actually point to a time or an instance where they actually had that awakening. How's that? Yeah. How does that play? Well, you know, I, I'm writing right now uh, a book on radical environmental movements, and I actually start off uh, the the, um, the chapter I'm working on right now starts off on looking at some of the earliest forms, which do come out of Australia. The earliest forms in Australia did have that sense of the sacred, and they did uh, some of the most radical early uh, blockades, and they put the, 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 some of the largest arrests uh, in uh, grassroots environmental history began in Australia. I should probably add that, that one of my uh, friends, John Seed, was among them, the Australian uh, deep ecologist, who uh, was also very much a, a Buddhist at the same time. And he created even a process that was designed to either reinforce or awaken these kinds of uh, uh, feelings and experiences. And by the way, I like your, your neologism there. I, I'm not sure all of the ones that you've articulated are going to stick, but that one is easier to pronounce. And I think, it's, I think it's quite needed. If you're the first one that's come up with that, I might borrow that one from you. Yeah, please. Uh, because, you know, I've done a lot of interviewing with people, and you're quite right, quite often to... I mean, sometimes it's just a growing awareness. Sometimes it, it, people cannot uh, identify a particular place. Usually if they were sort of raised in a way where parents uh, kept pointing to them how marvelous, how wonderful, how incredible the world is, right? But many people do have those kinds of uh, ecophonies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Seed himself developed with Joanna Macy, uh, uh, a Buddhism scholar in North America and Arnie Nass and a few others, what they call the Council of All Beings. You probably have heard of it. Mm -hmm. And he took that process, which you can look at online, just Council of All Beings, probably .org, but you can find out, you can find examples of it and even templates for doing it. But it's a ritual process that usually takes place over, ideally it would be like two and a half, three days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really a, a process where through depending on how you look at it, either it's kind of performance art or almost neo-shamanic getting in touch with the, uh, the ways in which non-human organisms would talk to us if, they, if we would listen. Sure. Um, and it also provides an opportunity for those who care to mourn together about 
the great losses that are unfolding, which helps to do what religions are supposed to do, which is to bind us together in, mm. in loving kindness mm. so that we can go into the world in service, right? Mm. And it's a very powerful process that they developed, and, and nobody has done more to spread it around the world than your countryman, John C. He's been, I, I don't know how many countries he's, he's uh, done this, and he's trained others to do it. And I've seen the power of it uh, with uh, different subgroups and different uh, age groups. So this is just one more example of the creative invention of ritual for our time. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my theories that I'm going to be articulating in this book is that when I talk about radical environmental movements, uh, I think they would have and will be more powerful when they take their own organic spirituality more seriously than they often have. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you, you obviously be across um, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, absolutely. I've been, uh, frankly, I've been delighted to see its emergence. Mm. Um, and it's a, a good trope. It's, mm. you know, mm. George Lakoff talks about getting ideas and tropes that are sticking in the mind, easy to remember and understand. You know, that's why I like that kind of guy and earth religion. Once you get Gaia, it's, it's sticky. Yeah. Cacophony. yeah. I think a cophony could be sticky in the mind. It's already stuck in my mind. You know? <laughs> um, uh, so this is where I'm running into trouble with my friend the other day. He's saying the perium is unpronounceable. The idea of Imperium Vitae Planeta um, is unpronounceable. And, th and that's actually one of the things I'm, I, I need to, after this conversation, I'll cogitate and I'll go back and, and rework the Bible, which is effectively the website. I mean, that's the idea that all of the thoughts are encapsulated mm -hmm. in one place. But it might need to be renamed um, in order, because there's no point in having it being a great idea, but the name turns people off. You're absolutely right. Sticky is the term um, that I use. What would you call it? You know, um, you know, I'm not out to start a new religion, so, <laughs> but I do. But I do think about this a little bit. You know, I, I do like the, um, I like the Gaia trope. I think it's sticky, mm. and 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 that said, the the science is still complicated. And uh, Tyrell has a, a book out that says that that. The, the idea of the, of the earth functioning like an organism is probably not gonna pan out scientifically, but there's other science that emphasizes the deep interconnectedness of all life. You know, you are a symbiont, you know, somewhere between one and three percent, one out of every three cells in your body isn't you, it's some bacteria, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, without which you would not be here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so, and, and even the evolutionary process we're learning now is not just uh, the traditional Darwinian understanding, but now we have to add to it the idea that DNA has sometimes, it's actually crossed directly cell, across cell membranes. Mm. That's not the traditional natural selection understanding. Mm. So there's all this interesting science that's emerging, but the basic, but, but the trope doesn't have to, you know, work perfectly as science to be a good myth, right? So yeah, yeah. I see Gaia, uh, and if I do a, a lecture, I see it all over. It's sticking in the mind. I, I'll, I'll show you. If, I don't know how much time we have, but yeah, I, I well, think I have. We can. A, I, I, what I was going to do was to cut this off at an hour, which was five minutes ago. <laughs> but we can keep well, going. Let me just show you. Uh, okay. Let me just show you. Share this with you. Oh, where'd it go? I thought I was bringing up. That's coming. Uh, that. Can you see that? Yeah. Great. Okay. So this is of all things. Um, I was at the World Summit on Sustainable Development uh, in Johannesburg in 2002. And Sony, the Japanese yeah. electronics company, had this whole program about thinking Gaia. And they were, they were claiming was that everything they were going to try to do in the future would be based on sustainability, thinking like Gaia for the life of the earth. So they were announcing this big sustainability initiative. Now, was that greenwashing? Mm. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't followed up on it, but the very fact that they, that they did that, that they were drawing on that mythic theme, yes. suggested to me that this trope has uh, traction. 
the power and, of the brand. Know, another company was talking about, you know, another Japanese company had this huge display in the, the, the Times uh, of um, Mother Earth. Uh, uh, Mother Earth as a trope. Now, you know, we can criticize that for its gender nature and so forth. I don't know what sorts of terminology are ultimately going to uh, um, gain the most traction in helping us to, in a pithy way, express our love and reverence for our home. Mm, mm. Um, but Gaia isn't a bad one. I say it's a good candidate for, mm. so, you know, there could be a, uh, in fact, I think there are. I think there are churches of, of Gaia. Mm. I know that Unitarian churches uh, have, uh, not uncommonly have services in which they really integrate kind of Gaian spiritualities and earth spiritualities into them. Mm, mm. So, uh, I, look, um, th when I initially started down this path, it was actually based around Gaia. And one of the other names that I played with was actually, uh, was right. So, I mean, I recognized the power of the brand, but, and then part yeah. of, part of the concern was that, um, when you go down that Gaia path, it's, connected with a whole bunch of stuff, which makes it more difficult to create new stuff. Okay, so Gaia is always about James Lovelock, it's always about, and so, so the idea was to sort of, how do you take that Gaia idea and then make it a bit, so I had this idea of GYA, Gaia, which is kind of nice because it's like the uh, short way of saying billions of years ago, which is exactly what we're talking about. So billions of years ago, life has been evolving. Um, yeah, and so, and the other thing as well, my name is Guy. And what I've been really conscious about <laughs> is I'm not trying to create a cult. I'm trying to create a religion. And so I just really didn't want it to be that this is Guy's religion because it's kind of Guy, you know, G-Y, you know, just put a U in there. So th that's not, so that's part of why I've just been sort of trying to find a new, way, effectively a new way of telling the same story, but just telling it in a, in a way that basically allows to bring in a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so one of the, in fact, I'll, I'll get you to speak to this slide, but I'll come up uh, in a minute. I'll talk about the perium diet. Do you want to just go back to that slide? Do you want to talk to that slide? Well, I just put it up there because it, it just, uh, it actually is just quite remarkable the kind of language that they're, that they're using, mm. uh, that this company is using, you know. Um, so you can kind of see that they're, going to try to harness technology to basically to save the earth and that they're pursuing um, this guy in vision. Mm. Um, mm. It just, you know, which describes the, the world as a living organism, which is very mm. much. And, what it, 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 is, and it's, it is, it is good. And it's been around since what, 72, the first papers came out. Um, and it's probably one of the most, um, I mean, if I was to try and get somebody to get their head around, the idea of the earth as a living organism, then they've done most of the work through that brand, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't, I'm not an easy answer person, but, and I don't think there has to be just, and I don't think there will be one way of articulating these kinds of feelings. Yeah. Of course. Um, so may, may uh, many flowers bloom and we'll see which ones gather, uh, the most cultural traction. Uh, Absolutely, and, that, and that's another good point. So the way that I did envisage um, the work that I'm doing now was to actually try and create a new template, a new way of viewing religion, if you like, vis-a-vis uh, -vis nature, so that somebody could actually, and they're invited to, copy all of the files off my website, give it a different name, change the icons and the colors, shift it around a bit, and then that, throw that one out into the environment and see whether it sticks and that maybe there could be a hundred versions of the same thing, like you say, because, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the, the scale of the problem that we've got on this planet is so big. We need thousands of new things. What, one thing I'm constantly surprised about is that when you hear of an innovator with a new incredible innovation, that's quite often just them and that there isn't 500 of them around the world. Um, so we need we need thousands of new earth based religions, and this is sort of my contribution into that. So uh, yeah, and I think it's important to you know to remember that uh, um, there have this this kind of sensibility that we're talking about. Uh, some people have had this kind of sensibility for many many millennia, um, and with their own kind of uh, cultural ways of. 
expressing it and um, you know expressing appreciation of it. Mm. So um, it's it, what's uh, what's different is that we have more scientific tools to uh, to teach it and to convince more people. Uh, I'm going to share just a, a co oops a cover here from just okay. a, a student. A, a student uh, magazine out in California just a few years ago. I happened to be there giving a talk, and their their cover story was Guy. I mean, Guy is all over. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, Bron. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna call the um I'm gonna call the the uh, interview part of this to a halt now. Um, okay. Mainly it's a pleasure just, to be with you. Yeah, mainly just to try and keep it within the hour, so that's that's consistent sure. across the um. But you stay on, and we'll just continue the chat. Um, Ron, yeah. thank you very much. That was really the first time that I'd had somebody with your your degree, your depth of knowledge um, uh, look at what I've been working on, on the, over the last couple of years. And so um, I'll well, just bring this on board. And it's a pr it's a privilege to learn what you're up to and to talk with you. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, Bron, and um, look forward to uh, maybe having you back on the show again sometime in the future. All right. Well, that was a that was a great conversation with um with Bron Taylor there, and um, um really that was the first time that I have had somebody with that that great um, deep understanding of um, what I was trying to do in in creating the in creating the Perian religion. I've talked to lots of people about the project, uh, but that's really the first time I've talked to an academic that could put some um, proper brain power onto it and and help me understand really what the benefit of uh, of 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 it of perium where where perium could potentially go and what it could potentially be good for that's one thing that has been um, concerning me for a while. I mean, I've been working on this thing in this sort of organic way, just sort of following my senses, um, but without having that sort of disciplined idea about what its what its purpose could be. But what I now realise is that whilst there are many people who are coming to earth-based spirituality. Um, there is a strength in having a, a structured, branded way of doing that. Quite apart from the fact that if uh, Perium were to be incorporated and then actually registered as a, a religion, then you have those um, tax benefits. Now, you can't sniff at the tax benefits because it means things like you can own land, which we so you need to own. If we're going to have a Periampus, we're going to have to own land. And if we're going to own land, we need to have the proper tax deductibility so that um, it's easy to actually do the things that we want to do. Um, uh, so that's a pathway. And so the idea is then is that is that it's a good thing to have the structure, the icons, uh, the name, the branding, um, the formalities, um, because then it makes it easier for people to see it as something bigger and better and more distinct than basically just an idea. Um, so that's that was exciting. That was a great interview, um, and uh, and really complements well with the previous interviews that we've had. So if you're not familiar with this channel, uh, we've recently interviewed um, Paul Elric, Professor Paul Elric, who is the um, author of the uh, Population Bomb, 1970s, um, a Stanford uh, University academic focused on um, conservation biology and those things. We've talked recently with. Um, Professor Will Steffen, who is um, from the Australian National University and who is one of the um, uh, brains behind the planetary boundaries uh, framework. And also uh, um, uh, he sits on the Anthropocene Transition Group, uh, Working Group. And um, we've recently spoken with, uh, we had Guy McPherson, Professor Emeritus Guy McPherson on the show talking about near-term extinction, which of course is a part of the dialogue which says that you know the sort of extreme deep collapse of civilization and and the biosphere killing off all the humans in a very short amount of time so there's some pretty some pretty um heady stuff goes on on this channel and um look forward to more um having having had those interviews that we've had thus far uh now really opens the door to be able to invite pretty much any anybody on the planet onto the show and hopefully they'll say yes um, and uh, we're going to be doing more uh, work with Perium, drilling down into Perium, 
Um, I'll be reviewing the website really shortly and then uh, putting that back up with some new elements to it. And so this is an exciting space. Um, we've got to find something new and amazing and we've got to find lots of it because this planet is in dire straits right now. We've just come through an election in Australia where um, we've just got the crazies in for another three years. Growth is the only thing they know how to do. Um, fossil fuels is the only thing they know how to do. So uh, this is an idea where we'll be drilling down into new ideas and the science that underpins them. So thank you. More soon. been dreaming about Guy Lane's new book, Time to Wake. Climate change is here. Normally it's just the everyday people getting hammered, but last year over a period of just a month the rich, powerful and famous people felt the wrath of the changing climate. The Italian coastal town of Rapallo was hit by a powerful Mediterranean storm that knocked down the sea wall, allowing huge waves to destroy hundreds of luxury yachts sheltered inside. With a damage bill of over 600 million euros, the storm left the rich people wondering where they could take their yachts to safety. In Florida, Hurricane Michael wiped out the Tyndall Air Force Base and hammered $6 billion worth of high-tech fighter jets that could not be flown to safety. Even the powerful institution of the US Air Force was blindsided by this monster storm. In California, the city of Malibu is prime habitat of Hollywood A-listers. The Woolsey fire forced the evacuation of the entire city, including one of the most famous celebrities in the world, Kim Kardashian and her family. The Woolsey fire demonstrated that even fame is no protection from climate disasters. Today, under climate change, no one is safe. The rich, powerful and famous, and all the rest of us, we're all exposed. You see, climate change is not just some future threat, but a clear and present danger playing out in the real time right now. It is faster, nastier, and much more abrupt than ever thought. So if you are still asleep to what's happening to our world, it's time to wake. Climate change is here. <laughs>